Welcome and hello. Let's talk about baby sleep training, which if you follow me at all, you'll know that that's a term I really dislike. We prefer to talk about it as sleep teaching here at the Helping Babies Sleep community. Hey there, I'm Dr. Sarah Mitchell. I'm a chiropractor, but found my passion empowering parents just like you to teach your little one to sleep and parent confidently day and night. And our topic today is sleep training, advice from a sleep consultant. So let's talk about what sleep training is first off, because I think it's got a really antiquated um, old fashioned definition. I think a lot of people think about closing the door and letting their baby cry themselves to sleep, which is not what is gonna happen here. Okay, it's so much more than that. Our online class is actually two and a half hours in length. So uh, you can tell there's a lot more detail than what I just gave you. So let's give you some preliminaries to get you started, to help you on your journey to figuring out how to help your baby become an independent sleeper. Okay, so let's first make sure you're in the right place. You are in the right place. You may need to do some sleep training or sleep teaching as we like to call it. If you're finding yourself taking hours to put your baby four months old and older to sleep. This includes toddlers as well. If you have kiddos, you have to lie beside to fall asleep. You have to rock them, feed them, reinsert the pacifier a thousand times. And you're just finding it really hard to sustain it might be time to think about doing some sleep teaching. Maybe you don't have any trouble having your little one fall asleep, but then they just won't stay asleep. They wake up 40 minutes into sleep or 40 minutes into a nap or multiple, multiple times at night. Or maybe your baby sleeps okay at night. You don't think it's so bad, but you're just having such a hard time with naps. Maybe your four month old and older will only sleep on you or only sleep for 10, 15, 20 minutes at a time. Whatever the situation, you're, you've, you found our YouTube channel here and our Facebook group because you're looking for answers. So let me give you a generalization on the two main reasons that kids struggle with sleep for four months old and older, okay? The first one is that they are reliant on something external to help them relax into sleep. So on my book, The Helping Baby Sleep Method, The Art and Science of Teaching Your Baby to Sleep, there's a sticker and that yellow sticker says, why drowsy but awake is setting us up to fail. Because here the th here's the thing, when you understand the first pillar of the helping baby sleep method, which is that the drive to sleep is biological, but the way we sleep is a learned habit, you'll realize that if you're constantly making your baby drowsy, you're doing the act of relaxing them, which is ultimately the skill that they need to learn. Okay. So the number one reason most kids struggle with sleep, like for me, it was waking up every couple of hours when my son was four months old to nurse him back to sleep is he's reliant on something external to help him fall asleep. So he has a poor sleep association. He associates feeding with falling asleep, but this could be true for being held, being rocked, sucking on a pacifier, or even co-sleeping, something external that helps your kiddo relax into sleep Okay, after four months and older. The second reason is that most of the kids that I work with, and this was my situation as well, have become overtired. So you get stuck in this negative feedback loop, which is the overtired cycle. And in this loop, it becomes harder to fall asleep and then stay asleep. And then the next day you had a bad night's sleep. And so it becomes harder to fall asleep and then stay asleep. And it just keeps looping essentially. Okay. The other main thing you need to know, so you know, understand the two reasons why your little one's struggling with sleep. The other thing you need to know is that there is no quick tip to this solution, okay? If I had a dime for all the Instagram messages that I get asking me for a baby quick tip, there's no quick tips because to have an independent sleeper, you have to unlearn an already previously taught skill. Isn't that mind boggling? Yeah, so I had taught my little one that the boob was for sleeping. And so I had to reposition the boob for fuel and then teach him some independent sleep skills. You need a methodology and a system to help you be successful, okay? And here, let's run through real quick, the five pillars of the helping baby sleep method, okay? The first one we already talked about, it's really understanding that the drive to sleep is biological. Yes, it's biological, physiological. We all need sleep to survive. But the way we sleep is actually a learned habit. You think about yourself. If you climb into bed tonight and I say to you, you can't sleep in your favorite position and I'm gonna take away your pillow, that will be very uncomfortable for you. You will toss and turn and kind of be frustrated for a while, but eventually you will learn a way of relaxing yourself into sleep. And that's what we have to do with our little people. That's what sleep teaching is, right? It's just that we might offer more or less guidance depending on your situation. The second pillar of the helping baby sleep method 
his timing of sleep. So knowing what the best timing for your little one is to go down for naps and for bedtime, depending on their month's age, um, up into the toddler years. Okay, so putting kids down too early or too late can actually make it harder for them. We, especially when you take away those sleep crutches that they're reliant on. You, we have a resource for you that we're going to post in the comments below, which is our sleep timing chart by month. And that's the most simple thing that you can do easily without tears to help you improve the number of night wakings and the ease at which your child falls asleep for bedtime and naps. The third pillar of the helping baby sleep method is being an intentional feeder. So when I was going through this, I really wanted to be baby led and feed on demand. And there's a lot of great things about that philosophy. But if you find that you're doing that and you're struggling with sleep, you might have to pivot some of your philosophies a little bit to get this to work for your current situation. So the third pillar is being an intentional feeder. So if we're going to bring a kiddo who's used to feeding to sleep, if we're going to bring them to the breast or the bottle, we are getting a full feed in. They're getting a full feed, active feeding, or you know a certain number of ounces. So that one, they get filled up when they're awake. Okay, and two, then we rule out the variable of hunger when they're fussy an hour later. Okay, well, I know we had a full feed. It's not that. What else could it be? When you're on more of a feeding window or flexible feeding schedule that we teach, you have a greater, um, you start to develop your other parenting skills and not relying on feeding, to feeding, and which ultimately ends up falling asleep. That's what happened to me. The most common things people misread are the most common signs people misread and I did this too, is mistaking the signs of fatigue for hunger and then consistently reinforcing when I'm tired, I get fed to sleep. That's what I did. The fourth pillar of the helping baby sleep method is messaging and being consistent. So that's the purpose of all our little nap time and bedtime routines to help cue our little ones up that this sleep time is coming and help them have a little bit of wind down time with the most, their most favorite person in the world, you, in the place that they're going to be sleeping. And then the fifth pillar of the Healthy Baby Sleep Method is the one that people really think about when they think about sleep training, which is responding. So if I've decided that my little ones, the way we're doing things is just unsustainable for us, and I need to teach my little person how to relax themselves into sleep without the bottle, the pacifier, the bouncing, the rocking, and all of that, then I need to take away that known way of falling asleep so that those new skills can develop. And when that happens, for sure, they're going to be frustrated because I'm making sleep harder for them, changing habits, learning something new. That's hard, especially when they're already tired. How am I going to offer reassurance that they've been heard? Or how am I even going to offer some physical and verbal touch that they've been heard? And that's the responding pillar, right? Okay, some more helpful guidance here for you on your sleep teaching journey. So this is for babies four months and older, right? Don't do this on a whim. I've seen so, par so many parents come to me saying, oh God, last night was the worst. At 2 a.m. I just decided I couldn't take it anymore and I let them cry. Try not to do that. It's too hard to learn something new in the middle of the night. And it's too hard to implement a methodology. Like it it's, not a, it's not a quick fix, right? So it's too hard to implement a methodology in the middle of the night when you're already tired and cold and self-doubt will be high. You wanna make sure that you set yourself up for success by booking like a weekend that you'll be able to devote the attention and time that teaching a, learn, uh, teaching a new skill requires okay so clear your schedule of social engagement and give yourself a weekend at least for something new to work you also want to have a crib after four months not a bassinet okay and not sleeping on the bed your child needs a specific safe sleep space where they can move around and reposition their bodies it's very common that when we start sleep teaching uh, kids often start to roll those first couple of nights as they're trying to figure out a way that they can make themselves comfortable in their sleep space you also need to do sleep teaching. You need to have your little one in a sleep sack and not swaddled. You need your hands available for sleep teaching. And then you're gonna ask yourself, where would I like my child to sleep? Will they be in the same room with me or do I wanna put them in their own room? Either can work. You also wanna be gauging progress. So what does progress look like? Well, yeah, maybe the first night it took them a while to fall asleep, but then the second night that, night that time decreased. Or maybe even the first night they slept a longer stretch than they ever have that they ever have. That's completely possible, right? You're looking for some sort of progress. Tears, unfortunately, are usually part of the process. I never wanted to hear my little one cry. I'd spend months making sure that he didn't, right? Which is true of many of the clients that I work with. But I got to the point where I realized that the way we were doing it, the no tear approach that we've been trying, just wasn't 
wasn't working for us anymore, right? I looked at him and he had bags under his eyes and I was starting to feel a little resentful. So I was like, okay, we can have productive tears, tears that I know are going somewhere, leading me where something to something better, right? Having your baby cry during sleep teaching is kind of inevitable. I mean, I've had kiddos that I've taught that, that don't cry, but part of that is their temperament and they're more flexible than say the average kiddo. A lot of my parents worry about, will it hurt the bond that they have with their little one? And here's the thing about secure attachment. Secure attachment is formed over weeks and months through the hundreds of little interactions you have with your little person every day. A few days of sleep teaching is not going to harm that bond and attachment that you've already established over weeks to months, okay? I remember sitting beside a pediatrician on a panel one time and we were talking about the common um, objection people have about, oh no, the crying is gonna raise my baby's cortisol. Well, actually, physiologically in the night, your cortisol does raise anyway to get you ready to wake up for the next day. But the physician said to me, you know what else raises a baby's cortisol? Is waking up more than three times in the night and not getting enough sleep. If you're looking for kind of like step-by-step -step instruction on how to implement all of these pillar pillars and have a little one who is an independent sleeper. Independent sleep means you can put them down completely awake, walk away, and they hum, moan, suck their thumb, put themselves to sleep in roughly five to 15 minutes without being made drowsy in advance, right? They can sleep through the night or a long age appropriate stretch of sleep. And not to mention they can nap like champions. We've got an online sleep school that can help you where we offer the knowledge that you need, the step-by-step -step approach, as well as the expert support to help you in your journey. Cause you always have questions about what your little one is doing. So you can check out Helping Baby Sleep School in the link below. As a mom of two and having helped hundreds, probably over a thousand kids at this point, I just want you to know that you can be loving, attached and well-rested and you don't have to do it alone. If you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to hit subscribe to never miss a baby sleep trip.